This is part two on the videos, the basic principles of economics and understanding the economic way of thinking. Now we'll cover points four, five, six, and seven. And the first one that we're going to talk about now, number four, is sunk costs are sunk. And a cost that's already incurred, but one that cannot be recovered, then it's considered a sunk cost and should be ignored. For example, I took my wife to see a Tori Amos concert. Tickets were $40 a piece plus parking let's say $100 we paid just to get into the venue. And after a couple of songs, my wife leaned to me that she really didn't like it. Well, I offered to, to leave. Should we get up and leave? And she said, no, we already paid $80 for the tickets and the parking. But that's irrelevant, right? What's wrong with her thinking? She's not looking at those costs are sunk. We're not going to get those back anyway. Why compound the problem by having her sit there miserable? Let's go do something else that's fun. That's a lesson learned. That cost is sunk. Let's move on. Another example, suppose your town has voted to build a bridge that's going to cost $10 million to build, but the town is going to benefit by $12 million. Should you build the bridge? Well, yeah, that's a $2 million benefit over the $10 million cost. The bridge should be built. However, after spending $5 million, nearly all of it, to, so once the bridge was approved, the spending was approved, $5 million was spent, and all of it was to deal with unexpected obstacles. Maybe there were things in the water that they had to get away from the head of remedy, and uh, there were things that they could not recover. And now they realize it's going to take an additional $8 million above that $5 million already spent to complete the bridge. So that's $13 million. Remember, the benefit was only 12 should your town finish the bridge? And most people would say, no, 13 is more than, than 12, so they shouldn't. But they're missing the sunk cost fallacy. That $5 million is sunk. If you quit the bridge now, you lose $5 million. If you finish the bridge, you lose only a million. You're going to spend $13 million total for $12 million in benefits. So that $8 million to finish the bridge is greater than $12 million go ahead and finish the bridge. The five million is already sunk and should be ignored. Another example of Sunny Skies is a nice ice cream place near campus. Sunny Skies is profitable during the months of May, June, July, August, and September. And then it loses money, even though it remains open, it loses money in March, April, October, and November. And again, those are my estimates. I'm not positive this is true. Uh, and it shuts down during January, December, January, and February. But the question is, why remain open during those months in which it's losing money? Why stay open in March, April, October, and November? Well, in the short run, fixed costs are sunk costs. The building, licenses, those are irrelevant. As long as the revenue generated from selling ice cream can cover the cost of the employees, the energy, the, the product, you know, the materials needed to make ice cream, then anything left over can be used to help offset those fixed costs. And yeah, so the idea is not necessarily making money, but it's minimizing loss. And in the short run, sunk costs are sunk. Another example I use is the stock market. Suppose you buy 100 shares of stock for $200 per share, and a month later that stock falls to 150 a share. So now you've went, gone from $20,000 to $15,000. It's not uncommon for people to say, ah, oh, can't sell this stock now. I got to hold on to it. I can't lose that money. That's a sunk cost. That is a sunk cost. Now, if you expect that stock price to go up, there was some anomaly, bad news, it was short term, well, then maybe you want to hold on to it. However, I use this example here. This is Comstock Home, home Building Company that was selling for about $200 at the peak of the housing crisis and fell to the point where it's now worth about $2 a share. And those people who held on to it thinking, well, you know, one day it's going to go back up, that's a sunk cost when, that when it started falling. You need to bail, put that money in something else that's got a better return. Number five is efficient choices are made at the margin. So using this example, you're going out for steak, you're pretty hungry. If you eat one portion of steak, it gives you $15 in total value, and each portion costs $10, so your total cost would be $10. If you have two portions, your total value increases to 27 and you incur an additional $10 for that second steak, so that's $20 in total cost. Or if you eat three portions of steak, now your total value increases to 36 and your total cost is an additional 10 so that's $30. Should you eat all three portions of steak? If not, when should you stop? Now, 36 is greater than 30. We could even do the average. 36 divided by 3 is 12. 30 divided by 3 is 10. 12 is greater than 10. 
yeah, you should probably eat that third portion. But what you're ignoring is the marginal change. The first steak got you $15 worth of added benefit for a $10 cost. When you order the second, your total benefit went from $15 to $27, so that's a $12 gain for five for $10. Yeah, you should probably have that portion. But the third portion only increases your total value by $9. So you're paying $10 for $9 worth of value. You want to stop at the second portion. We want to look at things at the margin. For example, given that crime control is costly, can we ever have too little crime? And most people would say no. My gosh, we can never have too little crime. We should get rid of all crime. Really? I understand we want to get rid of murderers and rapists and muggers, but do we really need to spend resources to stop that monkey from stealing hubcaps? Probably not. It may not be a good use of our time. And therefore, we're going to stop once the, the last dollar spent on crime control is equal to the last dollar in benefit and then we'll stop at we'll stop before we move any further because I don't want to spend say a hundred dollars an hour or a hundred dollars a day to hire somebody to watch hubcaps that just doesn't make sense the cost of the hubcaps is negligible relative to the cost of hiring somebody to watch them why is it guaranteed you won't marry the best or the perfect spouse and the question is are you gonna spend all day well, you your whole life looking for that perfect you know perfect person and the answer is no you're gonna go on till just good enough so always think about that your spouse will be just good enough matter of fact this is so much so I gave this to my wife on our first anniversary I said you're not the best I could have done but you're good enough to so that the marginal cost of looking for somebody better would have exceeded the additional benefit once I found her and I'm sticking with you I understood the whole idea of marginal cost, marginal benefit. One more day looking wasn't worth it. She was good enough. And you will never marry the perfect spouse. But the reason this is important is if you go out looking for perfection, you're never going to find it. You're going to be grossly disappointed and your marriage won't work. Understand that your spouse, my spouse, also married an imperfect me. Um, but you can't go on forever. You're going to keep looking until the marginal benefit equals that marginal cost. One last example on this one. A number of states passed legislation sentencing to death anyone convicted of a second offense for molesting a child under the age of 14. And economists were outraged by this. And now economists aren't immoral or advocating for it, but how is this detrimental? Why would this this law, this legislation, be detrimental to the safety of children 14 years or younger? Well, the first thing is, if you change, if, if I'm, I've already been convicted and I'm in the act of molesting a child under 14, if I get caught, I get the death penalty. If I kill this child, I also get the death penalty. So the marginal cost of going from molesting the child to murdering the child is zero, and we would expect to have more younger ch children murdered as opposed to just molested. It's bad enough that they had to go through this, let's not murder them. And that's why economists want to look at the margin. We want to look at the marginal change, the marginal difference. Number six is information asymmetries are ubiquitous. In other words, there are always information problems. There are things that the seller knows that you don't know and things that you as a buyer know that they don't know. When I go in to buy insurance, I run into my insurance agent's office and I say, quick, I need a life insurance policy right away. That's an inf information asymmetry. And they have to wonder why. Okay, so matter of fact, you might wonder why anybody has insurance. Everything we do. How do you know medicine is safe and effective? How do you know the steak you order is exactly 10 ounces? How do you know when you go to an auto repair place, they're actually fixing your car and billing you for the right things? All right? How do you know uh, uh, what to read, what you've read in the media or on Twitter is true? I would probably discount much of it and how do you know a politician is telling the truth right we always live in a world of uncertainty we can never know you know everything and therefore a lot of decisions are made under uncertainty this is so much so that companies will spend millions of dollars protecting their logo developing a brand and protecting it because that brand conveys information and that reputation matters your reputation matters how you dress matters what you say and how you say it matters. How you act on social media matters. That's your brand. That's your reputation. And that's how people will see you because they have an information problem. I don't know what a great person you are. All I know is you said something pretty inflammatory on Twitter, and therefore I'm going to convey that information. Or I see the way you dress, and I'm going to convey some information about you in that. 
And so always think about that. The information asymmetries are there, and therefore you need to convey the right information. For example, would you hire this person for a senior management position at a law firm or a bank or an upscale uh, retailer? Why or why not? Here is that same woman. These are both mug shots, by the way, and I, I don't mean to ridicule this person. It's unfortunate. Um, but looking at the two pictures, you can see the tattoo on the neck is the same. It looks very professional, other than the tattoo. If you could remove that tattoo on the neck, it looks very professional. The one on the right doesn't. You might want to question, well, why do you have to be that radical or that renegade? If I'm a corporation, I want some conformity, and that shows me you're not someone who would conform. Lastly, I use this one because of studies that were done, uh, studies of college males and females, and what they did is they showed them different pictures, people looking almost exactly alike. The only difference was one was married, the other was single. For the females, they overwhelmingly said they would pick the married male of the two. And why is that? How can you explain that? Well, the married man says, this person is marriageable. This person's already gone through that one hoop. We know that they can be married, that they're marriageable, and therefore the women were willing to opt for the married person. Uh, I always ask this question, uh, you're in your mid-30s, say 35, uh, you might have been divorced, and now you're single, and a friend says, oh, I've got this great person I want you to meet. They're 33, they've never been married. Your first question, or let's say 38, they've never been married. Your first question might be, what's wrong with them? And so that conveys information. It's the same thing with a job. Oftentimes, companies are really reluctant to hire somebody who is in between jobs. That's why you should never quit a job before you have another one lined up. Because the question is, why, don't you, why weren't you working? What happened? And so this is information that's very, very important. Number seven is the law of unintended consequences. Choices often involve unintended consequences. Right? Looking forward you know, to predict an out looking forward in order to predict an adverse outcome is going to be very important. So what would you predict happened to prescription drug use among teens after the drinking age was raised to 21? Well, because it was now much more difficult to buy alcohol, teens went on to prescription drugs. Matter of fact, they had what were called Skittles parties where you would get pills out of your parents' medicine cabinet, go to a party, put them in a bowl, and people would randomly grab handfuls of them and take them without knowing what they've taken. And of course, that's a, a poor consequence. Another one was Nebraska Safe Haven Act. Great intention. The idea was to stop people from giving birth and then dumping their child in a dumpster, their newborn in a dumpster. Uh, so the state passed the Safe Haven Act, which was bring your child. They wanted newborn children, but they didn't say that. Bring your child to any hospital or fire department and leave them no questions asked. And of the 17 children dropped at the hospitals in the first three months, only four were younger than 10. None were infants. Four of those were siblings. Were, the four were uh, among nine siblings abandoned by one man. One woman from Michigan drove her daughter all the way to Nebraska to drop her off, her 13-year-old daughter to drop her off at the hospital. They've now changed the rule. Now it has to be an infant. But the idea was good intent, bad outcome, bad consequence. One more I look at is uh, what would you predict happens to the safety of children if a law is passed requiring all children flying on a commercial airplane be secured in an infant safety seat? This comes about because of a couple who had their child, a, ch some, a child under two, can sit on the lap of the parents for free. They don't have to buy another ticket. This child was uh, on the lap of the family and uh, the plane hit a sudden stop and the, ch the child's head hit the seat in front of them causing a little damage. I don't think it was permanent but these, this family went on to advocate that all children should be in child safety seats. Well, what's the unintended consequence? Well, first thing is I have to buy an extra ticket that may cost me four, five, six hundred dollars. I'm now instead going to drive, in which case a child is far more likely to be hurt in an accident than sitting on the lap of a parent. So we always want to look beyond the obvious to look for unintended consequences. What would you predict happens to the availability of bottled water before and after a hurricane if price controls prohibit retailers from increasing prices? So you have a hurricane, the demand for water goes up, or a hurricane is coming, the demand for water goes up, yet you can't charge more than, say, $4 for the case of water. What do you predict happens? Well, something like this. If you want to get somebody to stop, and this is a true picture in Florida, if you want to get people to stop stocking up and hoarding water, 
raise the price. Now there was a great example in Sweden where the first case was four dollars the second and any other additional cases are forty dollars a case that might be a good way of doing it.